Well, welcome to Compass, our missions navigating people to God. My name is Nate, one of the pastors here. So glad that you're worshiping with us, whether that's in the room. I want to welcome those of you who are worshiping online. And if you're a guest here today, an extra special welcome to you. We'd love to meet you. We'd love to connect with you right after the service. Out these exit doors here is next steps in the, the lobby there. We'd love to meet you, answer any questions you might have. We hope this is a place that feels like home to you. I say this every week, but give us six weeks. We believe God is up to something big here, and we'd love for you to be a part of this amazing community that we call Compass. And you just got to see the highlights from our Night to Shine prom for our, those with special needs in our community. It was an amazing night. We had over 150 kings and queens, and we got to celebrate, and it was just an incredible night to show the love of Jesus to them. And so thank you, church, for your generosity. Yeah. Thank you to everyone who served. Next year, we're going to get more kings and queens, so we need more volunteers. So uh, start thinking about that now. It's always that second week in February. So uh, make sure that you're marking your calendar now. You want to be a part of it. You don't want to miss out. If you missed out this year, you, you're left out, right? So uh, we are glad for those that were there. And man, what an amazing night it was. Well, you know, I'll never forget the day a friend of mine walked into my office, and he had made some really poor decisions, he found himself facing some serious legal troubles. He came into my office, his world had come crashing down and he didn't know what to do. The things that he'd done were gonna become public knowledge the next day. His family was never gonna look at him the same. His image was forever tarnished. He didn't know what to do or where to turn and so he came to my office this day asking for advice. And at points in the conversation, he'd mentioned that maybe it would just be better if he wasn't around anymore, to which I said, that was not the solution, and while he was gonna have to face some difficult things, and it would be hard, that his family needed him. His wife and his daughters, they needed him. His future grandkids needed him. And so, despite the past, I told him that there was a way forward. And that day, he left my office, and he, keep, he agreed to keep working on the things in his life and not to give up. And we'd meet regularly, and I'd ask him how he was doing, and I'd pray over him, and I'd pray for him and with him, and he'd share with me that he was scared for what he was going to have to face, but he promised that he was gonna push through. And for the first few years, he did that very thing. He fought, he pushed, we met regularly, and when I found out his case was going to trial, I immediately reached out to him. I sent him a text message letting him know that I was there for him, and I promised that I would be there whatever steps he needed to take. And he said that he was gonna remain strong, he was ready to deal with the repercussions for what he'd done. I wish that I could have been there for my friend on that day, but you see, uh, we had just recently moved here to Fort Worth, Texas, and so he was over a thousand miles away, but I told him that he could call me any time of day or night, that I was just a phone call away. Well, unfortunately, that would be the last time I would talk to him, because the next morning, he was supposed to be arraigned. He woke up before the time the police were going to come to his house. He got in his car, he drove to a nearby field, he dialed 911, and he took his own life. I wish that I could have done more. I wish that I would have checked on him even more regularly. I wish that his family didn't have to go through the pain and the repercussions that they still experience to this day. And honestly, I'm not sure that I realized just how hurting my friend really was, or I fully recognized the signs of what he was crying out for on that day that I texted him. I wish that that wasn't the story that I was telling today. I so wish that he was standing next to me today. But you know, through that experience and through the experience of others who have walked through the doors of my office looking for help, who have been struggling in their life, and even some of those closest to me searching for help, there's some things that I've learned along the way that I wanna share with you today, as, as well as lean into scripture, that I think could be really helpful for us when it comes to understanding how to help others who are dealing with mental health struggles. And over the last two months, we've been in this series called Sound Mind, and we've been looking at what is Jesus, what does scripture have to say when it comes to mental health? And we've said that for far too long, the church has been silent on an issue that they shouldn't be silent on, that Jesus talked about this, and so we're not gonna be silent about it. And our prayer through this series has simply been this, is that, that this would be a really helpful series for many, and I believe that it has been, because we've received the emails. I've seen this series shared more than any other series that we've done in the six years that this campus has existed. I've heard the stories of how this is impacting many families in a really powerful way. And I want you to know that this is something that we are passionate about here at Compass. It's always gonna be something that we are okay talking about with you, and we wanna walk alongside you in these things. 
And so today, as we wrap up this series, my hope today is to answer this question. How do we help others when it comes to mental health? And we talked about everything from burnout to anxiety to relational wounds to depression and a mix of other things. And at some point in our lives, we, we said we probably all experience relational wounds. That, that's something we can all relate with. Uh, others of us have maybe experienced depression or anxiety on a, a small level, uh, while some of you, you've experienced chronic uh, depression or anxiety with these things that we've talked about. And throughout this series, I've hinted at the things to do when we are the ones who are suffering or or talked about what it is like for someone else who is suffering, what they might be experiencing. But today, I really wanna flip the script. And today I wanna look at what do we do for the people in our lives who are suffering? How do we help the people in our lives? And and we wanna talk about that when it comes to uh, things like depression, if your spouse deals with that, or, or maybe you're a parent of a child who deals with anxiety, or maybe it's the coworker who's told you that they're burned out and you're trying to help them, or maybe it's the friend who's going through a traumatic event in their life. How do we help these people? And as we look to answer this question today, I wanna go back to something that we said a few weeks ago and Pastor Drew reiterated it last week in his message. First and foremost, what we've gotta keep in mind is this, is your loved one is a person to be loved, not a project to be fixed. I think this is really important as we set out to have this discussion today about this question of how do I help the person in my life who is hurting? How do I help my spouse who is dealing with depression and anxiety? How do I help my kids who are dealing with relational things at school? How do I help the other person? Now, now the first thing I think we've got to understand when it comes to this is that in life there are certain things that we can control, there are certain things we can influence, and there's things that sometimes we just have to accept. We're gonna call that our CIA today, right? The things we control, the things we influence, the things we accept. And I think it's important as we talk about this topic today to understand that there are things in life we've got full control over, right? But then there are other things in life where we don't have any control at all. We we may have some influence over them, but we don't have control. And then there are just simply some things in life that we don't have control or influence, we just have to accept what they are. Now, I was trying to think about how I could uh, paint a picture for you of what this is like, and what came to my mind is, like, imagine yourself being a Dallas Cowboys fan, right, okay? And you know your, your boy, he's, he's a Dallas Cowboys fan. I've proclaimed it now, right? I know it took a while, but there's certain things that you can control when it becomes a Cowboys fan. You can control whether or not you wanna be a Cowboys fan, right? But you know what you can't control? You can't control who Jerry Jones hires or fires as a coach. You can't control who they draft or who they sign in free agency. You can't control that. The only thing you can control is whether you're a fan. Now, if you wanted to influence Jerry Jones to get rid of a coach, or if you wanted him to influence him to hire uh, or to to get certain guys in the draft, right? There is one thing you might be able to do. You might be able, if you could possibly, influence the entire fan base of the Dallas Cowboys not to show up at AT AT&T Stadium. That might get Jerry Jones' attention. But ultimately, there's probably no way that all the Cowboys fans in all of Cowboys Nation, with, with, with your influence, you could influence enough of them to make a big enough shift to where Jerry Jones decides, you know what, I'm gonna listen to the fans for once and I'm actually gonna do what I need to do for the organization. So ultimately, what ends up happening is this, right? Next season, we're gonna roll, it's gonna roll around and there's gonna be a lot of hype around the Cowboys and they're gonna go out and they're gonna win 12 games and they're gonna get the first round of the playoffs and then they're gonna lose and they're gonna give our, let our hopes down again, right? Now, I'm just having a little bit of fun with this, but it's true of life. And understanding the difference between these three is vital as it relates to helping others. So for instance, if we try to control things we can only influence or if we try to influence something that we actually control, what happens is our lives get stuck. Or what else could happen is we can harm ourselves or we can harm other people in the process. Or when it comes to influence, if we fail to influence the things that we can affect, other people will suffer alone when they don't need to. So, a couple questions. What do I control? Well, I I control my life. I control my mental health. I control the things that I put into my life. What, What don't I control? Well, I don't control you. I don't control your mental state or the decisions that you make. I I can't control your marriage. I can't fix you, but I can help you. 
Now, we get in serious trouble when we fail to understand the control that we have in our own lives, and we get into equal trouble when we try to control the things of others that we have no control of, especially when it comes to mental health issues or of others. And look, we, we hurt for others and, and we want to assist them. That, that, that's a good thing. Your spouse is hurting, your child is hurting, and you want to help them. You want to help them get through the season that they're in. But the reality is, is you can't control it. You can only influence it. Now, I read a great book several years ago um, that coincides with this. It's called When Helping Hurts. And this book is really about uh, poverty in the world and how we as Americans, we are accustomed in the United States to, to kind of our mode is to just go in and, and drop off financial aid or resources or go in and build wells in areas where they don't have water. But actually what the author of this book argues when it comes to this idea is that it's not actually helpful, it's actually pretty hurtful. And the reason is that the people that you're trying to help, they don't have a lot of buy-in. You've done it for them, and so while it patches things for a time, it ultimately doesn't help them to get out of the cycle that they find themselves in. I got to witness this um, firsthand on my first trip to Africa several years ago, and I'm taking a group to the Dominican Republic from North Fort Worth in a few weeks, and we're going we're gonna to talk about this as well with that group. But we were out in this uh, remote village, and we got there and there was a water well that had been dug by this organization that did these wells all over the, the country of Africa. And, and as we were walking up to the well, uh, we found out that while the well had water in it, the, the village people, they couldn't get the water out of the well because uh, the pump wasn't working for the well. And so the pump wasn't working because the generator that was used to power the, the pump was actually broken because the, the people in the village, they actually, they didn't care about the generator enough to take care of it, and so they let it stay out in the weather, and it rotted, the, the motor rotted on it. And so while they had this well that they could get water from, they couldn't get the water from because they didn't have the resources that they needed. And I'll never forget that the missionary, as he told this story, he shared with us this, he said that while the thought to provide water for the people in need was a good thing, well, because there was no ownership by those who lived there, it failed. And you see, when it comes to helping others, you will harm yourself or you will harm others if you don't stay in your lane. Yet, that doesn't mean that we ignore the pain of others. Instead, it means we influence where we can, but we don't attempt to try to control people or the outcome because neither of those are under our control. So again, the question we're trying to answer then is, well, then how do we help others? Well, to answer that, I want you to turn with me if you've got a Bible or if you've got a Bible app. We're gonna be in the book of 2 Corinthians today. 2 Corinthians chapter one, Paul, who is writing this, he gives some answers to this very question. Now, before um, we get into what Paul says here, I think it's really important to understand the context of this book and why it was written and how it was written. And you see, Paul, who is the writer of this, he is writing this letter to this church in Corinth. And the reason that he's writing this letter, it's partly in response to some of Paul's critics in that day. You see, uh, if you know Paul's story, Paul was a guy who wanted nothing to do with Christianity, and there comes this point in his life where Paul turns to Jesus and he begins to tell everyone that he can about who Jesus is. Well, along the way, Paul experienced a good amount of suffering in his ministry, and his critics are arguing that because he'd suffered so much, it was a sign that he truly wasn't an apostle of God and that he wasn't being used by God. But as you read through the book, you see Paul arguing exactly the opposite, that Paul was actually pointing to the suffering as evidence that God was using him. And I want you to listen to what Paul says here, starting in verse three of 2 Corinthians chapter one. It says this, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, the God of comfort, of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also are our comforts abound through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our suffering, so also you share in our comfort. Now, I'm gonna have the team leave this verse up here for a minute because I want you to notice something. There's several words that are underlined there. In just these five verses, the word suffering 
Paul mentions five times. And in these same five verses, Paul mentions the word comfort nine times. So, so what Paul is saying here is this. He's saying that in the midst of the suffering that, that you might be experiencing, God and the, the, the suffering he was experiencing, he was saying God has given him the comfort and the power to endure. So it's clear from Paul's words that he understood this, that God doesn't protect people from suffering, but instead God gives us the patient endurance to endure the suffering that we will experience. And because God has given that to us, well then our job as the church, our job as Christ followers, because we have experienced the comfort of knowing Jesus is to pass that comfort along to others. And when it comes to suffering, I think we have to understand that suffering this is a guaranteed aspect of the human experience. Like when Jesus walked along this earth, he didn't say, in this world, you won't have any trouble as long as you follow me. He said, no, in this world, you will have trouble. But he said, but take heart, I've overcome the world. So suffering is a guaranteed aspect of the human experience. It's a part of the Christian walk. I, I heard it put this way, suffering, especially trials and discomfort associated with the advancement of Christ's kingdom is God's way of allowing Christians to become more like Jesus. So understand, suffering doesn't exclude you from God's grace. It opens you up to experience it and make it known to others. That's what Paul was saying when he wrote these words. I wanna read verses three and four again. He says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, the God of all what? Comfort, who does what? Who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can what? Comfort those in any trouble with the what? Comfort we ourselves receive from God. Do you catch what Paul's saying here? He says God comforts so we can comfort. In Isaiah chapter 66, God, he's describing himself to the people of Israel and he's describing himself as the comforter. This is what he says in verse 13, he says, as a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. I mean, just think about this for a minute. How does a mother comfort a child? You, you got to see some mothers comforting their children on stage here a minute ago, right? Well, what a mo mom does is they learn what a specific cry means and they discern between, is it a cry of hunger? Is it a cry of pain? Is it a cry because they're lonely? Is it a cry uh, because they need their diaper changed? Is it a cry because they're tired? And once she discerns that, then she directs how she comforts. Because comfort is more in her presence than it is in the action. And listen, this isn't discrediting that actions matter, but this is the realization that comfort in presence is so much more. It's the, it's the promise that God makes to us. He says, I will never leave you or forsake you. That's what brings us comfort. Experiencing his presence is what should bring us comfort. Now, it may not remove the pain. It, it may not provide every answer, but it makes every moment more endurable, and it reminds us that at minimum, every earthly sorrow has a sunset. I think that's what David was saying when he wrote these words in Psalm 30, verse five. He says, weeping may last through the night, but joy comes with the morning. Like David, what we've gotta realize is that while sorrow is a part of our life, there's always hope on the horizon if we have this relationship with God. And so with all this in mind, then the thing that we've gotta remember is that his comfort doesn't end with us, but that he comforts us so that, that he can comfort others through us. So, so back to this question that we're really trying to answer. How do I help others? Well, the call here from Paul is really pretty clear, and we need to comfort other people. And so what, what I wanna do is I wanna spend time talking about what does that look like because we've gotta get this right so that we don't mess it up because we can do it the wrong way and that's what we've gotta guard against. And so I wanna give you three ways to comfort those in your life who are struggling today that I think could be really helpful for you as maybe you're dealing with someone in your family or maybe someone close to you who is dealing with something in their life. The first thing I'll say is this, is comfort but don't harm. I mean, think about it this way. Um, doctors, nurses, they make, they make uh, a lot, oftentimes make what's called the Hippocratic Oath. And it's this, this uh, oath that they make that says, we are gonna uphold certain medical and ethical standards as it comes to our patients and the practices, and we're not gonna do anything that would jeopardize or harm the person's life. And when it comes to helping others 
who might be struggling with mental health issues, I think this would be a really good oath for you to take yourself. We should just say, do no harm. Like, I don't think any of us would disagree with that, right? And look, when it comes to confronting others at absolute worst, just don't make it any worse. Life is hard enough. Situations are bad enough. Don't allow your presence to make it worse. Now, how do we harm? There's a couple of ways I think we can harm. Well, the first one can happen this way, is we simply, we can harm others by doing nothing. Maybe simply out of the fear of doing the wrong thing, you do nothing for the friend who is struggling. And honestly, this might be the most detrimental thing that you can do. Ignoring their struggles, you see, it makes them feel as though they're unwanted or they're uncared for or that they're less than human. And I would say it's better to lovingly do the wrong thing than do nothing out of fear. The second thing that we can do to harm is through simply a denial of their circumstances. Like if we fail to acknowledge the pain that they're experiencing, that can cause harm too. Or, or if we minimize their sorrow, or we excuse it away, or we just pretend that it doesn't exist, that doesn't offer the other person hope. Actually, let me give you um, two words that you should never say to anyone who is suffering. You need to take these words out of your va- vocabulary immediately, and the words are this, at least. Like, you should never say to the person who's been married to someone for 50 years at their funeral, hey, you know, at least you had five decades together. Like, that, that's just not a good statement to make. So the words, at least, we need to throw those away when it comes to others who are suffering. You know, as a pastor, I, I've stood in the hospital room of people in our church who have been given not the greatest of prognosis. And sometimes it's really hard to hear. Some of them haven't been very hopeful diagnosis that they received. But you know, I was thinking about it, and I was thinking, what if the doctor came in and was like, well, there are some signs that this could be really bad, but you know what, we're just gonna ignore all those signs, and I'm just gonna give you a few things that maybe will give you hope, but I'm not even sure if it's real hope, it might be false hope, but I would rather give you that than tell you anything else. And so they name off a few positive things, but they really don't talk about what's wrong with you or how bad it might be. That's not good, right? Denial is not helpful. It minimizes what the problem at hand might really be. Now, does that mean that we shouldn't pray for healing or restoration? Of course not. I mean, we, we believe in healing. We, we sing about it here. We say, God, you are a way maker. You're a miracle worker. You're a promise keeper. You are light in the dark places of our lives. And so we believe in that. But to deny the circumstances that someone up, is up against, that's harmful too. So, so we don't live in denial, but we also can't live in despair. And so while we should recognize the pain of others, we do not have to live in despair because of the brokenness of this world. Because we have hope. And we know, but in the worst of outcomes as Christ followers, we have hope if life after death. You know, one of the things that's probably the hardest part of the job that I do is being asked to preside over the funerals of people in our congregation or even those that I don't know. And whenever I do a funeral message, there's always two things that I wanna make sure are clear in the messaging. The first thing is this, I wanna always first acknowledge the pain in the room. And the second thing that I wanna do is I always wanna mention that for those of us who are Christ followers, there's hope because of Jesus. And while there are times where we shouldn't speak, we should always carry with us this element of hope. Believing that a day will come where the the pain and the brokenness of this world will be gone and God will make all things right. It's what it says in Revelation 21, like my favorite passage of scripture to preach, which if you've been here for any amount of time, I've probably preached it more than anything else here because I love it so much, but it says this, there will be a day when Jesus comes, there'll be no more death or mourning or sorrow or crying or pain because God, he comes again and he's making it all new. And so we can live with that hope. So, So there's moments where we speak the truth without downplaying or denying the pain that the people might currently be facing, knowing that there's still hope. And so we comfort, we don't harm. The second thing I would say is this, is we comfort, we don't fix. Now, I'll be honest with you. I am a fixer. Like, if someone comes to me with a problem, I immediately go into fix-it mode. Like, I'm trying to figure out how I can solve the problem for them or just to give them the best advice that I can. Now. I'll be honest, this has gotten me into a lot of trouble with my wife, Amanda, because I like to go into fix-it Felix mode as soon as she 
she says what's going on in her life. So she'll, she'll be talking about something, and immediately my brain starts tracking like, oh, how can we solve this? And she's telling me the problem, and I'm already solving it before she even gets to the end, which never goes well for me, because I usually blurt out, here's what you need to do, right? And this is what she says. I'm not looking for you to fix this. I was just looking for you to listen, but thanks, Pastor Nate, for the godly advice, right? <laughs> Sometimes, and I gotta tell myself this, right? Sometimes our only job is to listen. Our job is to assist them, to help them, to support them, to love them, but we can't fix them. And notice again what Paul says in verse four here. He says, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with what? With comfort we ourselves receive from God. He says, so we can comfort those in any trouble with comfort. He doesn't say with solutions that we receive from God. See, God doesn't give us answers to solve all forms of human suffering. He gives us compassion to love all humans who suffer. Now, the temptation for a fixer is to try and fix things in different ways. Like, it might be like this. Well, God might be trying to teach you a lesson through this, which... God does teach us through suffering, but we should never assume that, that we are experiencing something from a lesson from God. Like We should never think about it that way. Or a fixer might say, you know what? If you just started a diet and exercise and you, you went all organic and vegan and you just drank kale shakes your whole life and started meditating, that would solve everything. And so they point to things like natural healing to solve it, which, listen, that stuff is gross, so let's just keep moving on, right? So they'll, they'll point to something like natural healing to solve it while ignoring the pain that you're experiencing. Fixers generally share something in common, and that is this. It's discomfort with discomfort. They, they don't like to sit in the pain of others, so they try to pull people out of the pain. It's their discomfort, not yours, which leads to their action. They're trying to actually make themselves comfortable in the discomfort. But again, our job isn't to fix. Our job is to comfort. Now the third thing to remember when it comes to helping others is this, is we comfort, we don't use. And I think this is one that gets overlooked. But sometimes what others will do is in the midst of the suffering of another person is they will use the one who is suffering for their own benefit. You know, what comes to my mind is, um, this is probably about, three, four years ago in the spring, some of you who lived here during that time, you'll remember it. We had like a string of like Wednesday nights, it seemed like every Wednesday night, there was a storm that came through North Fort Worth, right? And there was bad hail and winds and everything and there was roofs that were ripped off everywhere and just a ton of damage. And I'll never forget like the, the first Wednesday, uh, the first Thursday after that first Wednesday storm, I was coming home from the offices and we were still over off Harmon Road at the time and I'm coming down Bonds Ranch and I'm going around the roundabout there by the QT. And I look in the QT parking lot and there's like seven or eight roofing company vehicles all just kind of sitting there that day. And I thought, well, that's kind of odd. Like, what are they all sitting here for? And then I pull into my neighborhood and I pull up to my house and there stuffed in my door are seven to eight flyers of all these roofing companies who are looking to take advantage of an opportunity from a windstorm for their own benefit and their own good. And like those roofing companies, the last thing that we should ever do when it comes to helping others is use their story for our own gain in some way. That's not what they need. That's not what they want. They just need us to comfort them. So, so how do we do this well? That, that's kind of where I want to land the plane today. How, how do we comfort with the comfort that we've been given? The first thing I'll say is this, is be present over being profound. We're called to come beside people. We're called to sit with them, to walk with them in their pain and their sorrow. There's power in presence. For, for example, uh, sometimes I think about like, uh, at night, I'll, I'll be the last one here and I, I, I've either come back and I've got to lock up the building and like if you're in this room at night when all the lights are off, it is really eerie in here. It's kind of spooky, right? And so like I'm kind of like guard up walking through the building because I don't know like if anybody's in here or anything like that. And if I start hearing any noises at all, like I'm going full on Chuck Norris mode on people, right? <laughs> like I'm like ready to go. And so like I've got my guard up in case anybody jumps out at me. But I gotta be honest with you, like uh, during the day it's a little bit different, right? You can walk through, the lights are on and everything, 
And I like to have a little bit of fun with the North Fort Worth staff, and I'll, I'll try to surprise them during the day when they least expect it. Actually, I want you to check out what happened not too long ago with our worship pastor, Marshall. Check this out. <laughs> Marshall's wife is having a heart attack right now. Can we get help? Medic in the front. Um, now I show that for a couple of reasons. First, this has been a heavy series and we need to laugh in the midst of things too, right? But there's a reason why I show that and it proves the point. During the middle of the day, Marshall walked into this building when he knew there were others around and he let his guard down because he knew there were other people here and he wasn't expecting his pastor who was dressed in a wookie suit to jump out from around the corner, right? And a, t a lot of times when it comes to life, we're calm and confident like Marshall was walking into the building and the difference is, is there's presence, there's power in presence. I've always felt the greatest impact that I am ever gonna make is not through any profound words that I will say in a message from the stage but it simply be in the things like being present at the hospital for the family whose loved one has just been diagnosed with cancer, or sitting across the table at Starbucks with a couple who's dealing with marital struggles, or spending a week at middle school or high school camp with our NOFO students, or just being in the lobby before or after services to greet all of you. I mean, if you just look at the example of Jesus, when his friend Lazarus died, what did he do? John chapter 11, verse 35 says that Jesus did two things, just two words, it says Jesus wept. He didn't say anything profound, he was just present in the pain. And sometimes you just gotta focus on presence. But the second thing I'll share is this, is we need to be helpful over being heroic. I mean, think about this. Who, who wouldn't love to do something heroic for someone who is suffering? And look, that, that's an admirable thing. It's not something that's selfish. People hurt, and, and our instinct is we want to take the pain away, especially as parents. We want to take the pain away from our kids anytime we can. Yet rarely are we able to be the hero in the other person's life. You see, ultimately, in our story, there's only one hero, and that's Jesus. But we can be helpful. One thing that, that brings comfort is just lessening some of the weight that people carry. It's not heroic, but, but mowing someone's yard while their loved one is in the hospital, I mean, that could be a huge blessing. Or bringing that meal to the family who just brought the newborn home and is trying to figure things out what this new routine likes like, that could be helpful. Or offering to watch your friend's kids while they go to counseling for their marriage. We need to lighten the load. We need to focus on being helpful. Another important thing to remember when it comes to helping others is this, is we, we should be consistent over being dramatic. When the pain is fresh, here's what happens. We tend to do a really good job of coming alongside someone. We show up at the hospital. We're making the appearance at the funeral or we're sending the daily text of encouragement. But you know, as the newness of the tragedy fades, what happens is we too tend to fade. Listen, we need to keep texting. Reach out six weeks, six months, a year after the anniversary. Chances are maybe you're walking through something with someone right now. Don't stop. Or maybe you come to your mind like it has in mind of some people that I was walking through some stuff with and I stopped making those connections. If you've lost track, pick up the phone. Send the text. You can do it right now. Because comfort doesn't come in a single dose. It consistently shows up. So focus on being consistent. Okay, so we've talked about how to help others today, and I, I hope that it's been really helpful. But as we close out this series, uh, let me just talk to those of you here in the room, those of you online who are maybe, you're maybe struggling with something right now. If you find yourself struggling with anxiety or depression or relational wounds or burnout or whatever it might be, listen, don't hold it in. Don't hide it. If there's a lesson that I can learn from the burnout I experienced in 2023 is that I tried to fix something that I couldn't fix on my own. I needed the help of others to come alongside me, to pray for me, to remind me 
the truth of who God is, to remind me that I didn't have to go at this alone. And maybe you need that reminder today as well. And so what I want you to hear today is this, is that the church, we're here for you. We love you. We care about you. We want to give you the resources that you need. We want to help you reach out, ask for help. Don't go at this alone. You know, when I think about my friend who took his own life, I wonder if there's something more that I could have done. I wish that his story, it had a different ending. But unfortunately, we control far less than we desire. But we can influence. And we can take what God has given to us. And we can give it to others. We can't alleviate burnout or depression or anxiety or a host of other conditions. But we can love and care for people in the midst of those conditions. And the way that we do this is we love them. We value them. We see them. We hear them. We run to their sorrow when others are running away. We are that shoulder that we offer that they can cry on. We carry the burden with them without becoming involved in their situation. And we bring Jesus into every situation, dying to ourselves, serving others, and making much of him. And so as we uh, close out this series today, here's what we want to do. We're going to worship together. And we're just going to speak the name of Jesus over these things that we've been talking about. And maybe you're here today and you have not given your anxiety, your depression, some relationship over to Jesus. And you need to do that today. Uh, some of our pastors and our counseling friends are going to be up front here and they would love to pray with you. Or, or maybe you're here today and you know that you're walking in step with someone who is going through a really hard season right now. And you just need God to give you some wisdom of what to do in this season. I would invite you, if you need prayer for that, you can come. We'd love to pray for that person as well. And so we're going to pray here, and then we're going to worship together. And if you need prayer, you come as we worship today, okay? And Jesus, we come to you. We thank you that you are our comforter, that you are our healer, that you can take the broken pieces of our lives and you can put them back together. Jesus, I know in this room and even those online, there are some who are dealing with uh, depression, anxiety, who are dealing with burnout, relational wounds, or a host of other things, and they need you. Jesus, today I just ask that you would give them the courage to maybe to step out in faith and invite you in to move and work in their life. And Jesus, I also just pray for those who are walking alongside someone right now. Would you, would you just give them the wisdom that they need? Would you give them the words that they need to share with that person? And God, we as a church, we want to come alongside those who are hurting, who are broken, who are dealing with the struggle in their life, and we just want to be there for them. We want to be a resource to walk alongside them in this. And so, Jesus, we speak your name right now in this place. We speak it over fear, over anxiety, over depression, over relationships that have been broken, over addiction, whatever it is that needs to break in this place today and in the lives of others that we know. Jesus, we speak it now into this place. And we ask that your spirit would move powerfully right now in this moment. We pray this in your name. Amen.